Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian from the Royal International Air Tattoo at RAF Fairford outside London. And we are with the first Sea Lord, Admiral Sir Phil Jones. Sir, thanks very much for joining us. Pleasure. Good to see you. Obviously, Brexit is the number one question that everybody's talking about uh, in London, in Washington, and, and other capitals. Um, the United Kingdom, obviously, a key member of the NATO alliance and, and a number of other international agreements, but also a key EU military player. Walk us through, in the event that Brexit happens, and that ultimately all the mechanisms get triggered and it happens, how does this process affect Britain's naval relationships with its partner nations? Well, we understand the questions, we understand the concerns. It was uh, clearly a significant moment for the UK, but it's become very clear in all the work we've done inside the Ministry of Defence, uh, all the work I've done with my Royal Navy colleagues and talking to my close collaborative Chiefs of Navy uh, around all our partner nations, that it's very much business as usual. We, we have a, a very committed operational footprint around the world at the moment, uh, working nationally, working bilaterally, working multilaterally, working crucially as part of the NATO alliance uh, across all of its maritime tasks and standing groups at the moment. And that absolutely continues. Uh, we are committed to showing that we're not withdrawing the Navy back from any of that operational footprint. We're determined to show we will carry on operating with and working collaboratively with all of our close partners. I think the fact that this weekend sees a NATO summit will we'll see the reaffirmation of that. And of course, here at RIAS this weekend, we're seeing uh, the incredibly forward-leaning and positive way in which the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy are taking air power uh, forward. So uh, no change as far as I'm concerned. We, we crack on as we always have done. And it, it, is, it is a great day, two years late, but it's at least here with uh, the Joint Strike Fighter making its uh, sort of formal, official, international uh, debut here at the show. Um, obviously a key capability for both the Royal Air Force, but also the Royal Navy. Walk us through what the next steps are to get the aircraft out there and operating? Well, the two programs, uh, the aircraft and the carrier, are now starting to come together very powerfully and, uh, and it's wonderful to see uh, significant milestones being achieved for both. Uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth uh, close to final completion uh, up in the build yard in Rosyth. Our ship's company have now joined. Uh, we have an active plan to get them living on board the ship, which is, which is now alive. Its systems are working, its diesels are running, its radars are turning. Uh, and we have active plans for her first sea trials in the early part of next year, uh, her first entry into Portsmouth, her base port, and then her subsequent shakedown trials and workup, of course, initially as a ship and then subsequently as an aircraft carrier. And those plans are carefully synchronized with Air Command to make sure that the arrival of the F-35 in UK uh, as part of 617 Squadron based at Marham are, are, are synchronized with that. Um, it's important we get this right. Uh, we have to step steadily and progressively through first of class flying trials, um, initially with operational test and evaluation aircraft in the US as we establish the initial operating envelope for that aircraft from the ship. But as each day goes by, as each new milestone is achieved, we'll see a fully fledged carrier strike group come closer and closer uh, into being. And, and obviously Prince of Wales is 18 months uh, behind in almost every single one of those gates. But the first deployment is set for about 2020, is, is my understanding. Um, you've had uh, UK personnel obviously on US and French carriers to sort of regain the big deck operating capability. Um, but talk to us a little bit about why you're shooting for 2020. Is it possible to get that capability out to sea sooner than 2020? Well, the capability uh, will be progressively demonstrated uh, and, and uh, we, we have to make sure we can do it in progressive steps. This is, of course, a, a prototype aircraft carrier in many ways. The, the UK hasn't operated a, a ship this size ever. It's the biggest we've ever had. We've had nothing approaching this size for over 40 years. So we need to do this right and we need to make sure a brand new carrier and a brand new aircraft can come together effectively. Uh, in the second half of 2019, we're looking to put a group that will be as close as we can get it to a fully fledged carrier strike group to uh, to go out and allow Queen Elizabeth to work as part of a group more effectively and try and use some of the other rotary wing air power that she'll have embarked to take part in exercises off the eastern seaboard. I think that's really important. 2020 is a year of bringing the whole capability together and we'll see a fully fledged workup of the carrier and its embarked UK air wing and that's a really important moment. If that goes well well, then we'll probably have the ability to declare a capability to use that strike group as soon as that integration is done. 
but we have to allow time to do it properly uh, and therefore we're projecting to 2021 as the first scheduled operational deployment, the first time we know we'll have done enough work to deploy it into an operational theatre and use it effectively. But from a skill set standpoint, obviously um, you, UK personnel have been on American and French ships, um, have been studying these skills. Where are you on that curve um, and what are the, still the outstanding skill sets that you think still need to be refined? Well, it's a hugely significant contribution that the, the US and the French have made to enabling us to, to retain the basics of those skills um, during our gap in availability of carrier air power, not just for the air crew themselves, but for the ground crew, for the maintainers, for those working as part of a carrier strike group planning staff. Uh, and, and they've been embarked extensively in deployed operational US carrier strike groups and the Charles de Gaulle strike group as well. And we could not be more grateful for that. Now, Clearly they've been refining generic skills for how to run a carrier air wing, how to run a carrier strike group, but as we get closer and closer to doing it for ourselves, we'll have to make sure we've got the unique skill sets required to run a fifth generation aircraft from a Queen Elizabeth class carrier in particular. So eventually we'll take the generic skills we've been honing with the US and the French and we'll make them type specific to a Queen Elizabeth class and that's really what the integration in 2020 is all about. Manpower remains a challenge, and Royal Navy friends of mine tell me that when both of these ships come into service, it'll only exacerbate the sort of challenge the service now has. Talk to us a little bit about some of the trade-offs you'll have to make to buy back people to be able to fully man these ships, especially if you're going to bo use both of them at the same time. Manpower is a challenge in the Royal Navy at the moment. It's a challenge, I think, for all armed services in particular to recruit and retain enough engineering expertise. These are highly prized young people who have a number of exciting careers right across the engineering and technology sector at the moment. We've got to make sure we can recruit and retain enough of them. We're working very hard to do that. Uh, the Queen Elizabeth class carriers uh, are, have a manning requirement that is new to the Royal Navy, of course, and although some of the basic elements of the crew are pulled forward from the crews of the Invincible class carriers that decommission, there are specialists in there and the numbers are larger than that which we've had before. And so recognising that, the uh, Strategic Defence and Security Review last year has allowed the Navy to start growing in manpower again, the first time we've done that in 40 years. It's quite uh, small initially, but it's a move in the right direction. And it enables us to start configuring our manpower to man these carriers on a sustainable basis. So Queen Elizabeth has a fully-fledged ship's company. It's sufficient not just to complete the test and evaluation work that they're doing now to accept compartments from the builders to uh, have systems brought online but also to take the ship through her sea trials which includes of course the first of class flying trials through to initial operating capability. Prince of Wales a much smaller ship's company at this stage uh, it will grow progressively as it's required for the operational test and evaluation uh, and we are looking incredibly hard to balance all of our manpower resources to have the ability, if we need to do it, to have both carriers fully manned to be able to use them both operationally in the future. But that, that's a number of years off and we can refine our manning as we do that. Um, do you have enough, I mean the UK by obviously the Joint Strike Fighter Force, the Lightning Force is going to be a common uh, force to both of the services, both for the RAF and for the Royal Navy. But talk to us if you will, the number is 138. And there are those who are looking at this and saying, boy, you know, two carriers running at the same time, each with 36 aircraft on it, then attrition, spares, reserve, maintenance, and then the RAF will want some jets as well. Is 138 the number, or do you need actually more aircraft to fully equip these two forces? 138 is uh, an entirely realistic number to operate a carrier air wing from a Queen Elizabeth class carrier and have a land-based availability also. I think the important thing to remember about what the Prime Minister announced at the NATO Wales Summit a couple of years ago is that we would bring into service and operate both carriers such that one is continuously available all the time. And I think that's the key discriminator. He, he, he recognised the need to always have one of these at readiness to be used wherever it's required. But that doesn't mean both carriers need to be fully trained and fully manned and fully equipped with air wings both of the time. So they will sequence 
maintenance, in and out of maintenance, sometimes quite deep invasive maintenance, sometimes short periods of, of fleet time maintenance in their base port. They also have the capacity to uh, embark and operate other components of UK's warfighting capability as well, rotary wing, uh, an embarked military force, uh, and be used in other uh, humanitarian, non-combatant evacuation operations, and, and they won't necessarily need a full air wing. So the way we envisage their operating cycle at the moment, we'll, we'll have enough aircraft for what we need. You're um, developing a forward base in Bahrain. I was honored to visit Bahrain and both see what the US Navy and what the Royal Navy is doing there. Um, do you foresee other bases around the world? Because this is truly going to be a global UK capability. We deliberately set the ambition for the Queen Elizabeth Carrier Strike Group's first operational deployment as being east of Suez. And we haven't done too much work yet to define precisely what that means and where she'll go and where she'll operate. But it's a deliberately stated ambition to show uh, we want to stretch the legs of this carrier group. We want to see it used in areas of the world where we know carrier power achieves significant effects. And clearly we are learning from and have watched how both the US Navy and the French Navy use their carrier strike groups uh, in that Indian Ocean theatre. So we've set that as the ambition. Uh, we know that that's where those two nations would like us to come and join them in, uh, in carrier operations. That's where they achieve significant effect and they're looking forward to have us operating there. Uh, now Bahrain is going to be a, a new pivotal hub of UK joint, of course, but also naval operations in the Middle East. There are also exciting opportunities opening up with new ports like Duckham in Amman, which seem tailor-made for carrier support. Uh, and then, of course, if the political, geopolitical, military situation requires it, we can look to extend carrier operations further afield if need be. The, the great thing about the carrier is it, it, it can move at speed, it can cover a lot of ground, it can reposition itself and still have the same capability available to go. So we've got five years to hone that to get to get our ambition for that deployment right, but we feel we've set it in the right place by saying it'll be east of Suez. Uh, Type 26 is a priority. It's the new frigate for the Royal Navy. Um, a lot of work went into it. There appear to be cost challenges now and that there may be two classes of ships. Talk, bring us up to speed on how this program is going to evolve. What part is Type 26? What's Type 31? And what are the differences in the two ships? Well, the Type 26 is, of course, a key part of a carrier strike group capability. Uh, one of the key things that strike group has got to be able to do is to project itself with confidence uh, into a theatre where it may be a contested theatre, both in the air surface and underwater environment. And the Type 26 Global Combat Ship, a high-end ASW frigate, is precisely required to be able to project power uh, in the underwater space uh, in, into that theatre. So the Type 26s will be pivotally linked to a carrier strike group, as well as a raft of other work, including the protection of our nuclear submarine force. The figure eight is precisely the right figure chosen in the SDSR to have enough of those frigates available as they cycle through maintenance and leave and recuperation to have always enough of them ready for the tasks we need to do. Now what the government have said is they want to look to expand that frigate force uh, with a slightly smaller, slightly less capable uh, general purpose frigate in order to have more of them available, ideally, grow the size of the frigate force in due course. So we can both contribute to a carry strike group at slightly lower scale of capability, but still appropriate, but more importantly, position those frigates in all the other places around the world where we need to have the Royal Navy forward deployed, projecting power, protecting our trade, and looking after British interests. And there's a national shipbuilding strategy running at the moment. Uh, the Royal Navy is contributing to that. We're looking forward to, uh, to discovering what comes out of that towards the end of the year as we project our surface fleet build forward for the next 15, 20 years. And one last question. You spend your time looking at global naval developments. Russia and China have been very, very active. What are the things they're doing that drive the Royal Navy to sort of reconsider how it's going to have to operate 10, 20, 30 years from now? We're watching them very carefully because they, uh, they're global navies, they have been in the past, they're looking to, uh, to enhance that. Uh, we're seeing them coming back into global deployments uh, in the case of Russia and for the first time truly globally deployed uh, on behalf of China. And not surprisingly, uh, they are growing most obviously and powerfully in the two areas of strategic maritime capability, uh, nuclear submarines uh, and aircraft carriers. 
Uh, and that's why I think it's hugely important that for the UK, the Royal Navy is also the owner of those two strategic capabilities, nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers. And therefore, we want to be able to use those capabilities in a way that complements that deployed by our key allies, the United States, France and others, and also has the ability to go out into the world's oceans and claim our place protecting Britain's interests uh, as China and Russia do the same. And P-8 playing an important role in that overall force coming from the RAF. p 8 is a hugely significant component of that. That, that is a, a gap in our capability which the Strategic Defence Review in 2010 uh, brought in. Uh, we welcome the return of that capability hugely. It will play a huge role in protecting our own nuclear submarines in home waters but also in the deployed space a key role in working as part of a carrier strike group and we're looking forward hugely to having them in the orbit. Sir, thanks very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you.